grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Isaiah chapter 40 is one of the more important and probably familiar, at least, sections of the chapters in the Bible, and it's really awe-inspiring, partially because, uh, for once, God kind of actually lets it fly. You see, uh, God has been dealing with his people, uh, Judah, and the, the, in Isaiah's day, the kings of Judah were not very faithful, and there was corruption and idolatry throughout the nation. Um, the leaders acted really as if God or Yahweh was not real, and so Yahweh comes to say and to show that he is very, very real. But after he punishes them, he would still have to address a new concern because the wounded people of God would be wondering if because they had lost, did that mean God had lost control? Did that mean he still, that he no longer loved or cared for them? So uh, Isaiah addresses both these concerns saying, do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning, from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. See, at, at this point, Yahweh is nearing his wit's end with his people. And, and it's kind of like he says, don't you know? Don't you know who you're talking to here? Uh, you teach your children the wonders I've performed on your behalf. You've seen me in action. I'm the creator of the ends of the earth. You're impressed with your own plans but you know what it looks like from my perspective? Like a bunch of grasshoppers, uh, back one, sorry. Uh, like a bunch of grasshoppers hopping around and zipping along the ground. You're so infatuated with your intimidating and powerful rulers until I upend them, that is. Your plans seem so important and foolproof, but all I have to do is breathe on them and the nations and the rulers are scattered. However, if you just look up, you'd realize I've got no rival. I mean, how do you think you should respond, Yahweh says, after considering all this? What, what all I've done, what, how should you respond? Well, I'd encourage you to check out Hillsong's united song, So Will I, which does a, a way better job of answering this than I could. It's a song that plays on the radio, Christian radio, and it, it sort of says, uh, much more poetically and nicely, if Yahweh has made billions of galaxies and stars that reflect his power and his glory, well then, shoot, I guess I better reflect his power and glory too and worship him. If countless creatures get their breath from the Almighty and worship Yahweh, then I guess I could use my breath too to worship the Almighty. If the wind goes wherever you send it to, Lord, then I'll go where you send me to. And that's the same sort of response that Yahweh is looking to elicit from his people. After seeing how awesome God is, Judah, as well as you and I, should respond by listening to this almighty God, by repenting and by worshiping him. Uh, Isaiah says to the Israelites, uh, you moan and complain, saying, God doesn't see my pain. He can't help me. But remember who you're talking to here. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God is indeed 
a powerful God. And so it would be unwise to, to mess with him. You shouldn't mess with God or ignore him either. You should listen to him. As Israel is getting caught up in, in politics and wicked King Ahaz and the people of Judah think they need to lean on Egypt instead of listening to Yahweh, Yahweh reminds them that he is more than capable of keeping things in hand. In fact, he scoffs at all their political machinations and treaties and and he despises the fact that they're trying to get in bed with nations like Assyria and Egypt. And he says, the princes and plans are destroyed. All I got to do is breathe a little heavily on them. So don't take refuge in those sorts of things. Rather, lean on the Lord your God and listen to him. But not only can we learn from these verses about how powerful Yahweh is, which is necessary in dealing with a world uh, that is out of control or in the world of uh, is Judah's day, of uh, problems that are arising. It's good to know that God is powerful enough to take care of things. But it's also worth noting that he's bothered, uh, perhaps even offended, when his people trust in others. He is, after all, a, a jealous God, not, not because he's insecure, but rather he cares for us. He knows that he alone can provide for us the security and purpose that will fulfill our calling. And so he doesn't want us to waste our time on others. Jealousy can be a good thing. Um, what kind of spouse for that, for instance, would not care if their spouse was flirting or sleeping with someone else? What wife or husband would want a spouse like that, right? The comparison of the husband and wife is certainly a, a one that's repeated throughout the scriptures, both old and new, in how God wishes to relate to his people. And, and that comparison is telling, even if it's obviously not a 100% correlation. But what it tells us is uh, Yahweh sees us and wants a personal relationship with us. Our relationship with God is, is not just intellectual, or it's not just transactional, like he wants something and he, he wants to give something or get something from us. No, it's more than that. It's, it's personal. God's not simply looking to straighten out his accounts. No, God wants to be with us. God wants to be with you, his, you, you, his people. He does not want you wasting your time or your devotion on gods that will disappoint and disappear. Um, part of Judah's problem during this day was that they had forgotten that Yahweh was the living God, which Isaiah proclaims uh, throughout his book. The, they were starting, at least some of them, to think of God as, as simply the, the national religion. Worship of Yahweh was often still accepted at least again in sections of, of Israel, as a societal structure, uh, the same way that people sometimes think of religion today. Oh, it, you know, it kind of helps people stay in line, or, or it serves as a crutch for, for those who, who aren't strong enough to stand on their own. I'm, I'm sure you've heard this sort of understanding about God. Maybe you've kind of wondered about it yourself. Well, Jesus would certainly sympathize with the critique. I mean, he was pretty critical of empty religious ritual, uh, but not because he thought religion was worthless, nor because he thought that humanity could stand on its own and didn't need any help. No, Jesus was offended because God had tried to foster a healthy relationship with his people that would help them. That's why he had given them the laws. In Deuteronomy, it says, I've given you my laws and the reason is, I want you to have life. I want you to have it to the full, Jesus will say in the New Testament. However, the religious leaders in Jesus' day were instead using the Torah, the laws from Moses, for personal gain and power to push their own agenda instead of God's. You see, God is not a figurehead. 
He's, nor are his rules or his words weapons that we can simply use at our own discretion or for our own gains. Isaiah's uh, prophecy gave people a taste of what the real and living God is uh, uh, and what he was truly like. And, and a reminder, again, that even our God today, he's not a figurehead or, or a tool that we can use to keep people in line. He's not, or nor for that matter, is he some sort of like self-soothing device. He just helps us feel a little better. No, he's, that's the whole point of this. He's the living God. You know, he's a being, a person. If not a human being, he's a person. And so just like any other person, you can't just use them however you want. They are their own person with their own capacities and uh, even more so with the living God, right? He's not just, we can't just make him whatever we want. He is who he is. If anybody's going to be changing anybody, it's going to be him changing us. Uh, and, you, you know, uh, Paul says this in his epistle lesson we were just reading, you know, woe to me if I don't do, I, I, I have to share this. Woe to me if I don't. Um, and that's certainly, again, the way that we try as a church to proclaim Christ our Lord and how I aim to preach about him. Woe to me if I set God up as some sort of lifeless set of rules or, or a puppet that I or someone else can use. The point of the church is, is not just that we would be like-minded or that we might feel a little better about life, although those are often byproducts. God does care and helps. But the point really is to listen to the living God and, and to place our lives in his hands, trusting that he will lift us and preserve us. And that's a good thing that we got a God that's powerful and capable enough to do things and who sometimes has to correct us because Lord knows we're not always right. And the living God will indeed save and transform our lives. In fact, he will save us and transform us if we let him at all. Uh, and that's really the only way that we can be in relationship with him is if we allow him uh, to do that. Certainly, we're all sinners and we make mistakes and there's times and days and moments when we are less malleable uh, to what he wants us to do. But the good news is, again, that we live by faith. We live by forgiveness. And uh, we keep coming back to him, and that's the key point, that we keep coming back to our Lord to listen to him. Um, but the Apostle Paul reminds us, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows, right? And, you know, in an agricultural society, this made a lot of sense because if you put corn in the ground, you expect corn to come up. If you put wheat in the ground, you expect wheat to come up. You don't put one seed in the ground and expect something else to come up. And Paul encourages us not to think that we can somehow trick or fool God, but know that we really do need to sow seeds of faith, you might say, that we need to put our trust in the Lord because what we put in, that's what will come out. That's why we treat God as if he's real in our lives. That's why we um, why we treat things like communion is if they're too important to just do away with, uh, because it's a way in which the living God comes to us, a way in which he promises and interacts with us and gives us his forgiveness because of his sacrifice. I mean, sometimes it's a little intimidating to run into the living God. And you know what? He, he should be a little intimidating because he is an awesome God. He's not just a little pet that we can do whatever we want with, right? No, he, he's the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Even the demons tremble at his presence. It, it makes a little sense that we might shake in our boots a little bit. If, and if we look at him from afar, if we see him from far off, sometimes he can seem downright dangerous. And when we embrace our sin and avoid God, he definitely is far off and dangerous because sin, after all, separates. It's stepping away from God. And the further away you get from God, I think the scarier he looks. Um, but if you see him up close, you'll see a Savior. Come near to me, says the Lord, 
and I will come near to you. You see, when we confess our sins, God embraces us. The way that God uses his divine power is the the greatest and most wonderful mystery of all, because God used all that was in his power to do everything he possibly could to show us not that just we should or have no choice but to trust in him. Rather, he took on flesh to prove to us so that we could trust in him. He doesn't force anybody. Jesus never forces anybody he encounters to trust in him. But to those who stick around for the whole story, who, what could you do? What else would you want to do but trust in this Lord who lives and dies for us? You see, our Lord took on flesh to prove we could trust him. Our Lord did what seemed utterly impossible. The almighty and infinite God became a finite and fragile human being. And he did this to do something that seemed just as impossible. He changed the hearts and minds of human beings so that we could see him not just as powerful, but as our powerful savior and our eternal comfort. And that's why God says, to whom will you compare me? Why do you say, my people, my way is hidden from the Lord? Have you not heard? He gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases his strength. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In Jesus' name, amen.